Friday. Sergeant Ventresco was on the stand. Are we prepared to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Sergeant Ventresca is here. I have maybe three or four more questions for him, and then we can uh, move on. Thank you. Um, there is a preliminary matter I'd like to take up, and um, I have a motion. This is an issue that I think is going to start coming up on a daily basis, so I, I believe we need to address it now. On Friday, the court permitted uh, Sergeant Ventresca to test explain why he did certain things and took certain actions. He then mentioned a red Tacoma as a, as a vehicle that was, quote, associated with Mr. Dulos. And he also mentioned that Hartford, Albany Avenue, Route 44 is a, quote, high crime area, unquote, in Hartford. It's part of his thought process as to why he's looking for videos. There, there is a lot of problems that arose from that. First of all, as it will become eminently clear, Sergeant Ventresca knew nothing, zero, about a red Tacoma, quote, associated with, unquote, Mr. Dulos, because it belonged to one of his employees on the weekend of Labor Day of 2019. That's something he learned at least a week, if not two weeks later. So what that has done is opened the door to an area of the questioning that had nothing to do with the fact that Mr. Um, Sergeant Ventresca went looking for cameras. The only issue had to do with his Ford Raptor that they were looking to see if there were any vehicles not specific ones, and then they saw the Ford Raptor. So getting into the Tacoma basically jumped, leaped over uh, issues of confrontation, hearsay, and foundation, which were utterly lacking. And the witness did not mention all the other vehicles that belonged to other Ford Group employees that were working at that time for the Ford Group. So that's the first issue. Second of, it, second of all, by allowing him to just opine that Route 44 and Albany Avenue, where the Jamaican bakery is and Benji's Jamaican restaurant is a, quote, high crime area, it's, it was unnecessarily introducing racial bias into this case. Because it's also true that right down a, a block or two further is the Dunkin' Donuts Stadium, where the, uh, the Hartford uh, Yard Goats play double-A baseball almost every single week. So now we've had to get into the fact that when he made that statement, it suggested that no white rich guy from the suburbs would have any reason to be driving on Route 44 when it also happens to be the main thoroughfare for people who work in downtown Hartford because Route 44 turns in right there around the next corner into Main Street, a block, maybe two blocks further up. So. You know, I bring these things up now, Your Honor, because I want to emphasize this is not the trial of Otis Dulos. It's the trial of Michelle Traconis. Whatever, I'm not here to defend uh, Otis Dulos or what he did or didn't do in connection with the disappearance of his wife. But the court is putting the defense in the position of having to defend that because of the fact that my client was living with Mr. Dulos, and so there's already a guilt by association problem that's arising. The motion I just filed, Your Honor, on Friday the state said it, quote, had cases, unquote, that supported the notion that what police do, they can explain their motivation and their what hearsay they hear in exchange for why they took certain action. Well, I've attached pages from uh, Judge Prescott's uh, version of the sixth edition of the Tate's Handbook of Connecticut Evidence, which is the seminal treatise on Connecticut evidence. And, I, and there's many cases that I have attached that are in, those, in that section 8.9. But the most salient comment is, quote, on page 515, a police officer's conduct is rarely relevant to the crime charge 
and the officer should not be allowed to repeat statements made to the officer to explain why the officer did or did not do something. Well, the, the interpreter is unable to keep up, Attorney Schoenhorn, with your presentation. Uh, uh, let me repeat that slowly. A police officer's conduct is rarely relevant to the crime charged, and the officer should not be allowed to repeat statements made to the officer to explain why the officer did or did not do something, close quote. And then there's also the fact that I then shepherdized, and there's a case that uh, came out in 2021, which I cite, State versus Armador, that repeats that same point. And uh, like I said, I've been quoted a couple of pages here. And why is that important? Because if the state says it has cases to the contrary, well, you know, maybe someone needs to uh, let Judge Prescott know that means that his subchapter is just plain wrong and it needs to be uh, revised <coughs> based on whatever cases the state has not given to the court. And we're going to now have this happen with every witness because if we, we know the evidence, at least we've gone through all the evidence. And to now have to cross examine about a red Tacoma that this detective knew nothing about until a week or two later, and it had nothing to do with what was or wasn't uh, located on Albany Avenue. So for example, if he had simply said, based on the phone pings that he received, they went to look for cameras, they gave that information, he wasn't around, he gave it to the uh, other detectives to locate, and as a result, they obtained some footage then we could have moved right into the fact that there was um, footage of a, of a Ford Raptor that was similar to one that Mr. Dulos owned. I would have had no objection to that. But now to get into a vehicle that this witness clearly knew nothing about at the time, and I'll just to preview what's to come a week later when the police are at Fort Jefferson Crossing and they have a search warrant, Mr. Um, uh, Gumieni, Pavel Gumieni, drives up for Jefferson Crossing, sees the police officers there, and turns around, tries to get away, only to be stopped by the police. And then we get into what he was interrogated about or what uh, he was claimed he was <coughs> doing, and then they questioned that it didn't seem uh, uh, accurate. So that comes up. That's certainly going to be in the case down the road. But I don't get to confront and cross-examine this witness because he's not going to know where they got that information from. And I'm going to submit that at this point they didn't have it at all. But my bigger concern, Your Honor, is that's why I keep filing these motions in limine. The court needs to at least make the state make an offer of proof about these issues. And if it doesn't, the prejudice is that the jury gets to hear this. The state gets to do a speaking objection, so it gets to give an extra closing argument as to why it wants to get into certain evidence. And aside from it not being fair that the case proceed that way, it eventually, if it hasn't already, becomes a due process violation. And it denies the defense the right to cross-examine because when I ask this witness, as of that date, Memorial Day weekend, he knew, he had no idea that one of the employees owned a uh, Tacoma. So I'm also asking if that be stricken at this time from the record because I just don't know what else to do. It's a surprise. The police never, it says almost never. The, I'll, I'll just note that in the Armador case, which, just, which is just a couple of years old now, the issue was a witness to the case, not the police, went to the hospital at a certain time to see an acquaintance who was uh, involved in, who had been one of the victims in that case, to, um, uh, to and, and went there. And the, the, the notion of relevance has to do with not relevance to what the police do, it's relevance to the charges. It's relevance to the charges. And the fact that the police had, were looking for a car or to see whether there was a car, wondered why this, what this, um, this, um, suburban white guy who builds high-end homes is doing in Hartford, and there's also going to be evidence that my client was in the vehicle. She told the police, yes, she was in that vehicle, suggesting that the only reason to go to Hartford on Albany Avenue is for some nefarious reason. 
because it's a, quote, high crime area, which I'll note hasn't been true in 10 or 15 years. There's neighborhoods there that may be, but even the notion that Hartford and the main thoroughfare, one of two into town, is a, quote, high crime area, suggests that there's a racial aspect to that testimony, and now I have to cross-examine into that, and I just didn't think that was appropriate, nor did I want to go that way. So the state, by doing this, is opening up the can of worms, and I bring it to Your Honor's attention, because I don't know, because I have to make a record, you know, and, and each thing, you know, and the court maybe is tired of my um, objections, but I have to make the record. Sometimes we did sidebar <coughs> on, on Friday, we did a sidebar. I understand that that was not being recorded by the court monitor, but I don't know that for sure. I think I learned that after the after um, court adjourned that that wasn't recorded. But what was discussed at sidebar was this idea that the police get to explain why they do certain things. I said, but they don't. The court said, well, you know, we'll see where it goes, et cetera. These things do need to be decided in advance because otherwise, once the cat is out of the bag, it's prejudicial. And I, I just let the court know that you know I'm conscious of, uh, of the uh, concerns I have. I'm trying to defend a client here who um, we maintain is innocent of these charges. There's maybe a lot of evidence, at least um, a lot of um, circumstantial evidence against Fotis Doulos, maybe in his trial some of this, the rulings might be more appropriate, but they're not in my client's case. And therefore, I ask the court to reconsider that, to move to strike that, to strike the testimony about the motives and to not allow it unless the state outside the presence of the jury makes an offer of proof as to why it's relevant, again, to the charges against my client, not relevant to what the police were doing. Thank you. Well, before we hear from the state, Attorney Sean on the court never tires of objections. Counsel may tire of making objections. Court is never tired of objections. Attorney McGinnis. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning. And may it please the court. I find it a little bit ironic that the defendant would argue that there's somehow unfair surprise to her case in this particular instance. Um, <coughs> Attorney Manning apparently was up here with Attorney Schoenhorn for the better part of five to ten minutes prior to court opening, and this motion was served on us after the court came out um, and we opened court for the day. Um, so, you know, obviously Attorney Schoenhorn has our email addresses. He could have handed us the motion in advance so we could have had an opportunity to look at some of the citations. I guess for some strategic surprise reason, he chose not to do that. But let me just be heard on some of the substance, Your Honor, because um, these arguments are becoming more and more unhinged from the defense as this case is progressing. The only person in this courtroom that is injecting race into this proceeding is the defense. Is the defense. The state of Connecticut did not ask the jury to draw any sort of racial inference from the fact that it's a high crime area. Um, I don't know what they're frankly talking about when they say that that somehow injects race into this. I think that that's sort of a ridiculous argument. If Albany Avenue is objectively a high crime area, race has nothing to do with it. Um, and I'll just indicate, Your Honor, for the record that um, the, even the, the title to their motion um, is misleading because it indicates that they want to preclude testimonial and prejudicial hearsay statements by police officers. Of course, the problem with the title, Judge, is that in order for something to be hearsay in the first instance and thus be testimonial, is that it must be offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And so evidence of information that was relayed to police officers and why they took subsequent action is obviously probative of the issue of the investigative steps that were taken. And, you know, we had a chance to look at Artemore, or excuse me, Armador, during the course of the defendant's argument. And what the case indicates is that it is a fact-specific inquiry um, and that non-hearsay can be used for the effect on the listener. There is no sort of blanket rule that the defense is uh, asking for. And so if the defense has an issue with a particular line of inquiry taken by the state, they should object. The court doesn't tire from objections, and we should just hear those out as they, they come along. But this motion which again was filed just now in court for some strategic advantage on the part of the defense, 
to not give the state adequate opportunity to um, look at this and perhaps look at the entire uh, treatise that they cited instead of just the pages that they attached to their motion um, is, is sort of asking uh, in advance to exclude any and all evidence of uh, non-hearsay evidence. And I don't think that that's appropriate, Judge. Um, and I just ask that the court uh, deny this motion um, with the understanding, of course, that the defense can object if they feel that, that uh, you know, somehow the evidence is not probative. But I don't see how something could possibly be hearsay if it's not being offered for a hearsay purpose. <coughs> let, me, let me just respond briefly, Your Honor. Now, it was not my intention to work over the weekend to have to come up with a motion, which when I was down here, I, I wrote last night and I brought with me this morning. Whether or not the state was uh, in the room for five minutes or more before, as Your Honor notes, when the court came out on the bench, I was still setting up. So pulling things out, et cetera, is what I have to do to get ready. But it's not just the Artemore case, Judge. It's all the cases cited in what I attached right from the Tate's handbook. It's O'Shea versus Min Minone, M-I-G-N-O-N-E. It's State versus Robinson. It's State versus um, Gonzalez with an S. It's State versus Evans. It's State versus Sweeney. And um, State versus Vega, at the, which is in the CONAP case, 48 CONAP case. So this isn't one case. This is a long line of cases. And in the Artemore case, Armador case, the court sets forth that police should never be able to, almost never. And then they allowed in a non-police officer to explain why that individual went to the hospital to see the victim because it showed advanced knowledge, which was relevant to the charges against Mr. Armador. So I, I don't understand even the state's argument. Um, this was also the, this is also Ms. Manning's um, witness. So I'm not sure why I'm hearing from Mr. McGinnis instead of the lawyer who's pro, uh, propounding that particular evidence, unless the court and anyone can argue any point of law if an objection is made. That's not my experience, but if that's the court allows it, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to stand on ceremony. It's just that we don't have Mr. McGinnis propounding that evidence. We don't have even an offer as to why it was important for that officer to blurt out something that that officer had no knowledge about at the time. It's being done as self-serving to try and create uh, a, a, um, a closing argument when there's no evidence to support it. If then the officer even had said, we then saw a red Tacoma in the video, and that's why we seized it. The next group of questions, he's going to be asked to describe what he saw in a, in a screenshot of a video. That's where we ended for the day. And again, it's going to be the same issue. It was seized, and someone else can testify. And I'll note, I've agreed with most of these witnesses. They don't have to call the store owner or the owner of the camera system to explain it. I've offered to avoid that step. But if the court is going to allow witnesses to basically ignore the relevance and hearsay rules, then I'm going to no longer agree to that. And then they're going to have to call each camera owner to, to authenticate what's in there, because otherwise, there's nobody to cross-examine. So I stand by my arguments. It seems to me that it's black letter law, at least in Connecticut, that it shouldn't be allowed. And they're going to do this with every witness. They're going to do it with every witness, every police witness. Just, just briefly, Judge, a couple things. Uh, to begin with, <clears throat> um, as I recall, Attorney Schoenhorn argued a motion in limine uh, the other day with respect to a witness that Attorney Felsen was going to be handling. So I'm not really sure what he is indicating when he says that it has to be uh, one witness. If we're dealing specifically with motions, Your Honor, the court has allowed counsel the leeway to argue uh, those motions, and the defense actually took advantage of that very uh, fact the other day. So I'm not really sure where they're going with that. But I'll also just note that the motion itself is written not just specific to Sergeant Ventresca. As a matter of fact, I don't see his name even mentioned in the motion. It is for all police officers. So the idea that uh, the state uh, you know, can't have an, uh, someone else uh, argue it, I think, is a little bit um, specious, quite frankly. And um, I'll just note, Your Honor, that 
you know, the defense is, uh, you know, essentially trying to engage in legal extortion by indicating that they're going to renege on their previous agreements simply because the court is overruling objections. I think that that's, you know, frankly, low rent. And uh, I, I'd like to just address the merits of this, which is, the, this is a fact-specific inquiry, whether or not something is effect on the listener, something for the court to decide. If it's relevant, if it's the danger of unfair prejudice outweighs it, those are the inquiries the court has to do. And I'm asking that the court deny their motion without prejudice, and they can raise these objections when they come up. Thank you. The court will first address motions in limine in general. A motion in limine is designed to exclude from even the jury's hearing certain evidence that is unfairly prejudicial. For example, we had an example earlier in the trial. If the motion in limine called for exclusion of all evidence concerning marital discord, then the motion in limine should also indicate what that evidence is so that the court can determine whether that evidence is unfairly prejudicial. It's not the category of testimony that the court looks to in determining whether to grant a motion in limine. It is the specific facts or fact that the proponent of the motion believes is highly prejudicial <coughs> and unfairly prejudicial. What the court sees here is a motion in limine to preclude certain categories of testimony. Well, as both counsel are experienced, both counsel are not trying their first case. A witness can say anything at any time. It is not the court's role prior to hearing the evidence to help draft a script for a witness or a category of witnesses. A witness can begin to testify before a question is asked. It's not the court's role to stop the witness. The court is not counsel. It is not the court's role to pave the road for the state, and it is not the court's role to pave the road for the defense. It's not the court's role to set a pick, to use a basketball phrase, for the state. It's not the court's role to set a pick for the defense. That is left to the skill and experience and the training of counsel to bring an objection to the attention of the court by objecting. The motion is denied. You can bring the jury in, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. The 
council stipulate? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, I believe we left off with Sergeant Ventresca. He's right outside, if I may. Sergeant Ventresca is still on the road. You may be seated, Sergeant. Sir, may I inquire, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Just a couple questions. When we left off on Friday, um, How, I can't hear you with the this gentleman talking right in my ear. I'm sorry. Sorry, um, sir. With respect to uh, when we left off on Friday, we were talking about 304 Albany Avenue. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Uh, Based on what you learned from uh, 304 Albany Avenue, what did you do? I alerted the uh, uh, Troop L Major Crime Office, and I wanted to get a detective sent over to 304 Albany Avenue to pull that video. And um, when you said Troop L, what is that? Uh, Litchfield, Western District Major Crime Field Office. Okay. Is that part of Western District Major Crimes that you are? Yes. And are you the sergeant in charge of that? Uh, Troop L? Not Troop L, no. Which sergeant? Is uh, sergeant uh, Bisson. Okay. And after, at some point, did you receive information from that, um, from a officer with respect to 304 Albany Avenue? Yes. Uh, who was that officer? Uh, Detective Fitzsimons. Okay. Based, without telling me what he said or gave, uh, based on what, on that information, did you take any steps? Yes, yeah, so uh, it was the Thursday the 30th, uh, when that detective learned of that, what was on that video, it was a vehicle in question. I alerted Central District Major Crime, which is the Troop H field office, to get a detective over to Hartford C4, the Hartford Capital City Command Center. And what day was that? It was uh, Thursday the 30th. Did you ever send anybody from Western District Major Crimes to C4? Yeah, uh, I sent Detective uh, Buton on Friday the 31st to go to C4 as well. Detective Butin, is he assigned to your unit? Yes, uh, Western District Major Crime. He was assigned to the Troop G field office. Uh, I have nothing further. Thank you. Okay. Cross-examination. Is it so, Sergeant Ventresca? Yes, sir. I think we met. I'm John Schoenhorn. I represent Michelle Traponis. When you talk about Albany Avenue in Hartford, you also refer to it as Route 44, correct? Yes. And that's United States <coughs> Highway 44, correct? I would assume so if it's 44, yes. Well, it's U.S. 44, yes. right? And that's a major thoroughfare between Albany, New York, and I believe it goes to... Somewhere near Providence, Rhode Island, doesn't it? I'm not, I don't know. I, don't I take it, it you've never had to be a trooper <laughs> in eastern Connecticut, right? No, never. So that would be covered by troops that you visit very seldom, like Troop um, C, right? Troop K, that part of the state. It's covered by those troops, yes. But not you. Not me. All right. But you also know that this is a major thoroughfare, uh, multi-lane from... Uh, Avon, across Avon Mountain, right? Right. And uh, you said you were on, um, you were at, at one point at Fort Jefferson Crossing where my client and Mr. Dulles lived, right? Right. And then if you take the side road Deer Cliff, you come to Route 44, isn't that right? Correct. And then you take Route 44 down, it's at least, uh, it's a four-lane <clears throat> road, right? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure of the lineage on 44. But it's a major thoroughfare, right? I, I would say it's, it's a major route, yes. And then you come into West Hartford, right? <laughs> yes, east of Hartford, yes. The or west of Hartford, west, I'm sorry. West, west Hartford, Hartford no. would be west, west of Hartford. West of yes. Hartford. Okay, fair enough. Right. And then uh, you stay on Route 44. It becomes a commercial area in West Hartford, right? Yes. And then you get to the University of Hartford, right there on Albany Avenue, isn't it? Right there in the corner? 
I'm not sure the exact address, but I know uh, UHART is in that area, yes. UHART, that's a yes. fairly large private university right there, right? I don't know if it's large, but I know it's a private university. Well, it's lar large yes. lands, uh, landscape is what I mean, like, like land. Right. I don't right. know the acreage. Fair enough. And then you uh, cross the, um, I guess it's the Park River, and then that becomes Hartford right there, doesn't it? Um, again, I can't tell you exactly where the city limits are. If you're saying it is, then... All right, well, we looked at a map. Right. I could put it right. back up, but I just don't okay. want right. to show the map again. But one of the things we saw when you were uh, showing the various streets in Hartford along Route 44, there's a McDonald's right there, right? I, I, don't, I don't recall. You don't recall seeing yeah, that on McDonald's, the map? No, no. Or the satellite view, I mean. No. And you also know that if you go down another couple of blocks, you get to the Yard Goats baseball stadium, right? A double-A team stadium is right there, right? I think, it, I think it's there. Yeah, so that's the, the Yard Goats is a professional baseball team, right? Right. And that was there in 2019, wasn't it? I believe so. You're talking Dunkin' Donuts? The Dunkin' Dunkin Donuts, Donuts Stadium right there, right? And that you understand that a lot of people come from the suburbs to watch double-A baseball. Uh, absolutely. So when you, you yeah. use the term that uh, that portion of Route 44 was a, quote, high crime area, mm -hmm. was it because there was a Jamaican restaurant there? No, it's referring to the city of Hartford. The city is it? Okay. Yes. All right. But you didn't know if uh, Mr. Dulos had any um, business in Hartford at all, do you? Not, not that we knew of at the time. You knew that he built large homes, right? Yes. And But you don't know whether he owned or built in Hartford, do you? Did not know at that time. And um, you didn't know if he had any um, dumpsters available at that time either, did you? Did not know at that time. When you drove past Ford Jefferson Crossing, you didn't see a dumpster, no. did you? There was a for sale sign there, though, wasn't there? In front of his house. At four? The pictures we saw. At four? I can't remember if there was a for sale sign at four back then, back in um, May 24th. Okay. So we're talking about that Memorial Day yep. weekend, right? Correct? Correct. And you did go past um, 80 Mountain Spring Road, right? Yes. And you knew that was a house that was being built or had just been built by the Ford Group as of that date, right? Yes. And you, in fact, testified on Friday that you saw one of those large banner for sale signs showing the Ford Group in the picture, right? Yeah, something similar, yes. And and you couldn't remember if it was actually in front of the house or by the street, but you remember something similar like that outside. I remember there was something down by the road, uh, the, the, the base of the driveway. I couldn't tell you what was up by the house. Well, indicating the house yeah. was for sale, right? Right. And as of that date, did you know whether or not there were showings at that house on 80 Mountain Spring? No, I did not know. You were also testifying on Friday that uh, were different kinds of cars that you believed were, quote, I think you used the word, affiliated with, unquote, Mr. Dulos. Is that right? Um, I, I would say that's right, yes. Yeah. You right. mentioned a red Tacoma as one of those cars. You remember saying that? Yes, sir. Now, as of Memorial Day weekend, you didn't know anything about a red Tacoma be belonging to one of Mr. Uh, Dulos's employees, did you? Yes. That weekend you found yes, out about Yes, that it? Sunday. Or I'm sorry, that Monday. Not, not the weekend, but the Monday. Okay, but when you were driving around on, I think you said the weekend, no, right? Yes. You were looking for... Um, cameras and whatnot, right? You didn't know anything at that point about Not, not on Sunday, about the red truck. Okay. And you know that belonged to an employee of Mr. Uh, Dulos named We learned, Pavel, we learned, that, we learned that on Monday. Right. Named yeah. Pavel Gumieni, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, just, it wasn't registered to Pavel. It was registered, well, that's another... It, that was it wasn't registered, registered to Pavel's Pavel. Pavel's wife, yes, correct? Yes, correct. It was not registered to Mr. Dulos, was it? No. It wasn't registered to Michelle Traconis? No. And it wasn't registered to the Ford Group, the company? Mm, no. You, did you look into any other vehicles that were owned by other employees of the Ford Group at that time? Uh, yes, we did. That weekend? Uh, that weekend, we set, when we set up our command post, we put every employee that, that was listed on the Ford Group website mm -hmm. on our whiteboard. And we looked into every employee. And in fact, we sent leads out that weekend to start interviewing those employees. And part of that process, when we put them on the whiteboard, is to gather uh, intelligence through law enforcement databases and searches to determine what vehicles people drive, where they live, what their phone numbers are, et cetera. 
Were you looking for other vehicles of the other employees as you drove along Albany Avenue on Route 44? No. And you did know that that red Tacoma was about 20 years old, correct? It was yes. a 2001 Tacoma, right? Yes. And were you aware that it was, had, was leaking oil and was in bad condition? Very aware. Incidentally, you didn't look for any leaking oil along the route you were traveling, did you? No. I mean, there's multiple vehicles that drive routes. There's multiple oil stains all over the roads. But these are all things you learned a little bit later, is that correct? Well, well son, uh, that Monday I learned about the Tacoma through a neighborhood canvas. So we put that vehicle on our list of vehicles on that Monday. By the way, you didn't know whether um, Mr. Dulos had ever been known to um, dump construction garbage at uh, locations where he, sh where he should not have been doing that, did you? Not that day, no. On any no, day? No, never. Now, in your career as a state trooper, have you ever had to uh, investigate an illegal dumping case no. even as a road trooper? No. Isn't that something the I mean, state police sometimes investigate? Sometimes. I mean, mostly like debris on the highway. You know, people throw couches out along the highways and such like that. Oh, you ever seen contractors doing that so they don't have to pay for a dumpster? No. Never? No. And so that we're clear, you said that when you um, saw the uh, camera on the on the, on the Jamaican restaurant awning, you said you referred it to, you, I think you said Troop L. Is that what you said? Yes. You mean Troop H? No, Archer? Troop L, Western District Major Crime Field Office. Well, wasn't Troop H just right down the street from where the Albany Avenue is? Like maybe uh, six Washington, I think it's on Washington in, in Hartford. Yeah, isn't Washington, yeah. it's right near the Capitol, right? Yes. And you didn't contact them? No. And incidentally, uh, on May 31st, 2023, was Detective Fitzsimons assigned to the Western District Major Crime Squad? On May 31st? What year, what year did you sorry, say? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. On May 25th and 6th, when you uh, asked him to go look for cameras. He was assigned to Western District Major Crime Squad, yes. Right. And was he assigned as a detective or as a trooper? At that detective in the Troop L Field Office. Right. I just have a moment. Okay. Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. Sergeant May, step down. Thank you, Your Honor. If I may call it uh, Mike Fitzsimons, please. If I may have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. You may be seated. Governor, may I inquire? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, sir. How are you? Fine, thank you. 
Mr. Fitzsimons, uh, did you previously work for the Connecticut State Police? Yes, I did for 25 years. Okay. When did you part company with the Connecticut State Police? It will Police? be two years, March of this year. Okay. Did you retire? Yes, I did. Okay. And at what rank did you retire at? Detective. And was there a particular division of the Connecticut State Police that you worked at when you retired? The Western District Major Crime Squad. And were you, what troop were you assigned to? I was assigned to the Troop L office. Who was your supervisor? Sergeant Al Bisson. Ed, could you briefly just describe to the jury some of your training and experience as a Connecticut State Police so, officer? <clears throat> initially, I was hired um, by the State Police. I attended the State Police Academy. There were, were trained and tested in the uh, all the academia skills and procedures necessary to become certified as a police officer. I successfully completed the uh, training academy. When I graduated the academy, I was assigned as a patrol trooper. I was initially stationed at Troop L up in Litchfield. I was there for approximately eight years. Uh, throughout my 25 years, I've had uh, several um, several assignments from I was a canine handler and a member of our state police tactical unit and an instructor at the academy as a firearms instructor. But a majority of my career, actually 16 years of my career, I was with the Western District Major Crime Squad. Thank you, sir. If I could just have one moment. Yes. Simons, uh, were you working with the Western District Major Crimes Squad in May of 2019? Yes, I was. And what troop were you assigned to again? Where were you headquartered out of? I was with the Troop L office, um, which is also located at the Western District headquarters. And is that again, in the Western District is comprised of, uh, as far as the major crime offices and the troops, mm -hmm. or four offices and four troops. And again, we kind of work all in concert together. Um, kind of, I kind of equate it to like those of you who live in cities where there's multiple firehouses. Sometimes you only need one firehouse. Other times you may need several. So we kind of work together. And I'm going to draw your attention specifically to May 29th of 2019. Uh, what was your assignment that day? I was assigned to assist with obtaining a copy of video surveillance from an establishment on Albany Ave in Hartford. And what was that address, sir? The average was uh, 304 Albany Ave. Um, and the point I was supposed to meet, the name of the establishment was Benji's 2 Seafood Restaurant. of the um, of the court and the every, all the TVs are on. The if court's monitor is on. It is on. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. Oh, hold on this one. Do you have it? Your Honor, with respect to States 34, there are um, two items on it that have already been admitted through other witnesses. However, the last two have not. Sir, if I can draw your attention to the screen behind you, I'm going to show you um, what's been marked as, I guess, picture two. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph, sir? Yes, I do. And what is that? That is Benji's 2 Seafood Restaurant. And is that the restaurant you went to on May 29, 2019? Yes, it is. Okay. Why did you go there? Uh, I was assigned by my supervisor to download. They had video surveillance there. Uh, information was received or passed on to me 
that they, they believe there was information, believe in uh, photo stulos was in the area of Albany Avenue on May 24th, sometime between 7 and 8 p.m. Now, did you speak to anybody at the restaurant without saying what they said, please? But did you speak to anybody? Yes. Okay. And were you able to download any video? Yes, I was. Okay. I'm going to actually draw your attention to this screen again, picture one. Sir, if you need to, Your Honor, may I just ask him to Certainly. step near the screen? Thank you. If you can. Um, does that picture or map, if you will, depict where you went? That day on May 29th? Yes, it does. Uh, if you could please point that out. In this area, it was the Albany Avenue area near the intersection of Main Street. If I can, I can throw um, The knife and fork are. You know where the knife and fork are? It says Island Fish Head Jamaican Restaurant, sir. Is that the <coughs> restaurant you went to? It, it was it was called as far as I know Benji's Two Seafood Restaurant. I don't know when this was created. Okay, and that would be the Benji's in picture two. Yes, at the time. So in 2019, um, is this what it, the intersection of Albany and Green looked like? Yes. Thank you. Now, sir, with respect to the, you can have a seat. I'm sorry. Thank you. Did you? Look for a specific time frame. Yes, I did. What was that time frame? The time frame was between 7 and 8 p.m. from May 24th. Okay. And did you ask for a specific between 7 and 8 p.m.? Normally, I kind of create a buffer, so I probably have some, some time around 6.48, 6.45, so approximately 8.25. I usually give about a 15, 20 minutes on each end just to count for uh, any anomalies. And uh, did you uh, watch the video on scene while you were there at no, the I restaurant? Not. Okay. Uh, with respect to uh, that day when you received the <coughs> video, what did you do next? Uh, once it was downloaded onto the thumb drive or, or flash drive, I transported it to my office in Litchfield. Um, once I got to the office, I inserted it in my computer, uh, viewed it on the screen to make sure I had a copy and I wasn't coming back with an empty um, thumb drive. Once I saw that I had a recording, I, I made a copy of it, a working copy. And then what I do with the original is I take that and put it in evidence for safekeeping. Was the video continuous or motion activated? It was continuous. Okay. And did you review that video? I did. And where were you when you reviewed that video? I was at my office. Did you have a specific assignment in your review of that video, or was there something in particular you were looking for? Um, I was reviewing the, the working copy. Again, I wanted to make sure that I successfully made a copy. Again, we'll make copies of the original. That way I can disseminate it to the lead officer or, or counsel, what have you, down the road. Uh, that, that minimizes damaging or losing the original. Again, the original was evidence. So as I was going through the working copy, ensuring that I had success, successfully downloaded it, um, I was aware of the vehicle, one of the vehicles, or the vehicles, Fotis Dulos had registered to him. And then while going through ensuring the copy, I noticed a, uh, one of Fotis, what appeared to be, vehicle consistent with Mr. Dulos's vehicle. And what type of vehicle was that? Uh, a black Ford Raptor. After, was, do you recall what time that vehicle, or a vehicle consistent with a? Approximately 7.40 p.m. Okay. And after you would, saw that on the video, um, what did you do, if anything? So reviewing it, um, kind of monitor it, and as a, the vehicle had made a, a U-turn, it was coming Your back. Your Honor, I'm going to object to him giving a narration. The, the video will speak for itself. So the fact that he reviewed it, he logged it in, I assume that she wants to show the video. I'm not objecting to that. But I object to a sort of running sideline play-by-play. -play. 
that's fine, Your Honor. I can, it be states 35. I can play that now with. Thank you. It's sustained. No objection. Thank you. Thank you. I can, sir. I'm going to draw your attention to the screen behind you. I may just have one more. Yes. Recognize what's depicted on that screen? Yes, that is a, a an easterly view of Albany Avenue uh, at the front of the Benji's restaurant. Okay, when you say easterly view, um, let me just ask you, is if somebody was driving away from the screen towards the upper right, is that towards Hartford or away from Hartford? That would be towards Hartford. Can I hit the wrong? I apologize, Your Honor. I hit the wrong button. Okay, I'm going to stop it there, sir. Uh, if you want to mind, Your Honor, may I ask him to go to the yes. screen, sir? If you can, just on the upper, if you could point on the upper left-hand corner of that uh, video screen, uh, what does that time? What's it? Is that a time stamp? Is that? The upper left, the 05 24 2019 is the date and year. Friday, I mean, Friday, and then 07 40 and 55 seconds p.m. Now, after you watched this video, sir, did you take any screenshots of the video? Yes, I did. And what did you do with those screenshots? When, once I took the screenshots, I'd saved them, printed them out, and uh, I ultimately disseminated it to the uh, Troop G office. I believe this is States 34. Your Honor, at this time, there are two items on stage 34 that are um, for ID only, uh, unless a counsel has no objection at this no point. No objection. Then uh, if we can move uh, the entire of stage 34 as a full exhibit, those two items that the state is planning on introducing at this time also appear on uh, Sergeant Ventresca's as ID. But if they are moved as full now. Stage 34 will be admitted as a full exhibit. Thank you. So I'm going to show you uh, what's been in Martha's picture three out of States 34. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is it? That is a screenshot, screenshot of the Ford Raptor. Is that the screenshot that you took? Yes, it is. And disseminated? Yes, it is. In picture four. That is another screenshot of the Ford Raptor. And is that the screenshot that you took? Yes, it is. And disseminated? Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Cross-examination. No questions. Thank you. Uh, well, we will refer to you as detective. You may step down. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I believe if I can, uh, Josh Quint, please.
And you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Um, may I inquire, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Quint, uh, by whom are you currently employed? The Connecticut State Police. And how long have you worked for the Connecticut State Police? For about six months. For about six months? Yes. All right, what's your position with the Connecticut State Police? Uh, I currently work as a criminal analyst for the State Police. Okay, what is an analyst? Um, an analyst provides uh, investigative support to detectives, uh, troopers, patrol officers. Um, we just assist with investigations whether, by whatever means we can, whether that be law enforcement technology or commercial or law enforcement databases. Are you a sworn police officer? I am not. So prior to working for the Connecticut State Police, what did you do? I worked for the Hartford Police um, as a uh, crime analyst. And um, I spent uh, six years there. Particularly where? Uh, at the Hartford Police Department. In an, our unit was called C4. What is C4? Uh, C4 is the Capital City Command Center. Okay. Hence the four C's? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, how long did you work at C4? Uh, for six years. About six years. Uh, could you just uh, explain what C4 is? Yes. Um, so C4 is a unit which is assigned to uh, the, Harvard Police, the Harvard Police Department. We fall underneath the Vice Intelligence and Narcotics Division for the Harvard Police. The room, uh, it's a big room at uh, Jennings Road for the Police Department. In there, there's a bunch of TVs, a, a closed-circuit camera system, which belongs to the City of Hartford and the Harvard Police. And then there's a team of analysts and uh, detectives that work in that office collaboratively together uh, to help solve crime. With respect to all the video screens, what is it showing? Um, a lot of them are city cameras, uh, so they're on public poles throughout the city. And is it a continuous or um, real time? Yes, the feed is real time. What areas do the video cameras cover? Um, they're placed all throughout the city in different places. Um, it's mostly based off of infrastructure and where we could place cameras. Um, and a lot of it is based off of data that we have for uh, where violent crime occurs. Is it, are the cameras motion activated or continuous? So the cameras are motion activated. Um, when enough pixels are activated through the, uh, the camera, the camera tells the recording server to record the video stream that it's getting. And are they retained, the video? Yes. For how long are they retained for? Uh, up to 30 days. Does C4 also do other things, by the way, besides video surveillance? We do. Uh, so we help provide, uh, like I said before, um, commercial databases, law enforcement databases, um, so checks into those databases. Um, in addition to that, uh, phone forensics, uh, video enhancement forensics, um, and just kind of helping detective uh, solve their crime, whatever it may be. It, with respect to being an analyst, could you briefly describe some of your training and experience that led you to be an analyst? Yes. Uh, so my technical career started on the early side. I worked for Apple for a very short period of time through college where I worked on phones. Um, following that, 
Um, I did spend some time in the military where I acted as a, or I served as a military police officer. Um, during my time in the military, I attended a crime and criminal intelligence analyst course uh, down in Fort Leonard at the United States Military Police School. Um, following that, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense um, for the Army. And in 2019, were you working at C4? Yes, ma'am. And what was your position? I was a crime analyst. And at the, I'm gonna draw your attention specifically to May of 2019, uh, at the end of May. Uh, did you, did C4 go through video surveillance throughout Hartford uh, at the request of law enforcement in the investigation to the disappearance of Jennifer Duos? Yes. Were you part of that assignment? Yes. And specifically, what was that assignment? Um, I was contacted by my supervisor um, who had asked me uh, to assist uh, the New Canaan Police Department and State Police with a missing persons case. Um, specifically, he wanted me to check for video between the hours of 7 and 8 o'clock on the 24th. Is that 7 and 8 o'clock p.m.? Yes, ma'am. So how does that work when you, well, strike that. Let me ask a foundation question first. How many video cameras are in Hartford that C4 is capable of looking through? So there's over a thousand different camera views throughout the city. So how do you look through it for uh, a particular item or vehicle for a particular time, say seven to eight o'clock? So it can be done manually, manually, where we can scrub through the video and uh, actually look and find uh, manually what we're looking for. Uh, there's another option. We have a, a software program called BriefCam. Uh, BriefCam is a video analytic. I don't know if I should continue to explain. If you can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brief game is a video analytic, and the, the way that it works is it looks at all the different objects that move through the frame, identifies them by what they are, whether it's a pickup truck, a bus, a van, a car, and then it also separates it out by color. So now you could use this program to then go filter and find the different objects that appeared. And with respect to Brief Cam, uh, did you, are you trained in it? Yes, not formally, but on the job training. Okay, in fact, did you, did C4 help develop BriefCam? We worked with the company um, to help further develop their platform after they let us to start using the program. Okay. And with respect to the, um, was BriefCam something that you used for yes, this assignment? Yes, on a daily basis. Yeah, yes. Okay. And for this assignment as yes. well? Yes. Okay, so how, what did you do? Um, so we were given at that time frame between seven and eight o'clock. Um, to PM to look for, uh, specifically the assignment was to look for a black pickup truck, a black Ford Raptor, um, a white Jeep, um, and a black Chevy Suburban, and find something along, something that fit those uh, descriptions. It, were you, what day were you given that assignment? Uh, I don't remember the exact day. Okay. Uh, well, let me ask this, was it after May 24th? Yes. Okay, I'll move on. Uh, now, with respect to um, the use of brief cam, uh, was that utilized in the course of this assignment? Yes. And as a result of using brief cam, uh, was a video footage developed during the time of seven o'clock and eight o'clock? Yes. Okay. Uh, if I may just have a moment, Your Honor. It's 36, Your Honor. I don't believe there's any objection. At um, I'm looking at it right now. Let me just have one more moment to make sure. Running out of which one goes to here? This one? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have an objection to this. Thank you. Stage 36 admitted as full. Mr. Quint, I'm going to ask you to take a look behind you, please. All right, States 36. Um, what are we looking at? Uh, so this is uh, the video management system. It's called Milestone. 
Uh, this is where all of our cameras that we live stream into um, the PD. This is the system that they're stored in. It's where we can export video from um, and pull up different views and look at the video. Is this uh, um, what you would see at C4 in 2019? Particularly for this case, yes, because we're the, the streams that we would pull through that. Okay. And with respect to, I don't know if you could see it or you need to um, go up to the screen if I can, Your Honor, ask him to approach the screen if need be. Um, each camera viewpoint, I guess, these the grids, do they contain a separate camera? Yes. And with respect to the camera viewpoints that are contained on that screen, uh, what area do they cover? Um, so each camera, um, so the, the top row of these cameras covers the area of Albany and Blue Hills, which is an intersection in Hartford. Um, so there's a pan tilt zoom camera, and then there's three additional fixed cameras or four additional fixed cameras that show the intersection around that area. Uh, the area of Albany and Garden, which is, um, these are all just the uh, fixed cameras, and then the area of Albany and Center. Now you mentioned fixed cameras versus something else. Well, What's the something else? Uh, the something else is a PTZ or pan tilt zoom. Uh, that's how it's labeled up there. So it's a camera that we could move around um, at the PD, uh, but it's also a camera that is of a higher resolution than the other ones. With respect to, for instance, you said, I believe the first one, Albany and Blue Hills, would that be that first row? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Which one is the, <clears throat> just gonna say the movable camera, if that's okay? It's uh, the top left. Okay. And the other three would be our in fixed points? Yes, ma'am. With respect to the movable camera, was it moved during this time period? Or how are you able to move it around? So when, uh, in a live incident, we're able to actually uh, use a, the computer program, click into the live view, and then dictate where we would like the camera to be pointed at. When would you utilize that in a, in a live instance? Um, so being part of a real-time crime center, we support uh, a lot of shooting investigations that happen in the city. Um, so when there's a, a shooting that cops may be responding to, we're pulling up these live feeds, moving the cameras to points where cars may be fleeing, where we're able to get a license plate and then develop that further. Just would you also utilize it if like, a, um, like the marathon or an event or anything like that? Together? Yes, uh, okay. marathon, the jazz fest, all sorts okay. of different events in Harvard. Is that the, um, just it, that's the real-time portion of it, the real-time crime center for the C4? Yes. Just to, I just want to clarify, make sure we're on the same page. Um, now, with respect to Albany and Garden, did that have a movable camera? It did. Okay. Um, and it, is the movable camera displayed here? It is not. Okay. And I believe you said Albany and Center? Or yes. Is that the other one? Is that a movable camera? The one that's up here is not. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw your attention to, this is Albany and Blue Hills. I see the PTZ. Is that what you were talking about, sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what is down here? And if you can see, for the record, my cursor is highlighting the bottom middle portion of the screen. Oh, what is that? So that's the timeline. Um, so it shows you the date, uh, the time of the video. That's where it is uh, when you're playing it. Uh, the red is motion, and then as the video progresses, the bar will start to slide. Okay. And by the way, am I able? Are you able to, I guess, uh, go back and forth between the viewing of one screen versus back to that main view and go in between? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, start playing, sir. What's the time that this starts at? Uh, Seven twenty-nine. I don't know what the seconds were. I'm very sorry. Now, I'm actually going to fast forward a little bit. And well, while this is playing, sorry, what intersection is this? Albany and Blue Hills. Now, which road is Albany? If you wouldn't mind standing up and just pointing, if that's okay. Uh, this is Albany here, runs from east to west. And there's a road over here on the right. What is this? That's Adams Street. Okay, and over here on the left? I do not know what the name of the street is. <laughs> okay, and over here on this um, green and yellow awning side, do you know what that is? Uh, Scott's Bakery. Okay, and is this where um, the camera is? Is that an intersection? 
Yes, it's pointed just past the intersection. The intersection would actually be below the bridge. Okay. And if you were traveling, say, up towards the middle of the camera, that way, if you see the cursor going upwards, is that towards Hartford or away from Hartford? That's away from Hartford. Okay, so Hartford would be coming towards the bottom portion of the screen? Yes, ma'am. And did you utilize brief cam on this camera? Yes. And and again, what were what information did you put into brief cam? So we were given a time frame um, between seven and eight o'clock, um, specifically to look for um, a black truck or a black Ford Raptor, a white Jeep. Was it, well, with respect to the black Ford truck, were you giving the information of a black Ford truck or a black Ford Raptor? We were giving specifically a black Ford Raptor. Okay. And is this the video that Brief Cam gave you? Yes. So if you were to go back to that main screen, would it continue the same time frame? Yes. Okay. If you can, you can have a seat, sir. Or I might just, I'll probably be asking you to get up again. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if I go back to the main screen, uh, the camera view right next to it, is that time now, I paused it at 7.32.05, is that time picking up at 7.32.05? Yes, ma'am, it's a continuation. It's a continuation, okay. And with respect to this uh, camera, if I can, uh, where is this camera located? Uh, so this is the southeast corner, um, right behind the telephone pole if you have McDonald's. Okay. And what road is this vehicle turning down? This is Milford Street. And is this one of those cameras that can be moved? No. Oops, sorry. Now, does Albany Avenue have cameras, or I'm sorry, not Albany Avenue, does C4 have cameras down that street, that, Mil that Milford Street that was in that direction? We do not. Okay, are the only cameras that uh, relate to this along Albany Avenue? For this incident, yes. Okay. And is there another camera that in is there another camera that picks up that truck? Yes. Okay. Now you mentioned the McDonald's. Is that that is the yep. Okay. So we're still at the same intersection, sir. Where is the Milford Street that the truck went down? So it, it would be on this side. Okay. So, down, uh, that side. so, is there a way in this road right up here? Uh, that's a that's a plaza entrance. Oh. And last you indicated there was a fourth camera. Here I'm actually just gonna scroll back. Which camera angle is this, sir? So this is another one of those fixed um, cameras and this is just northbound. This road here would be Milford Street. And this would be the road on it. Attorney Manning, it is now about 11.16. We should probably take our morning recess. Okay, yes, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take our morning recess and resume at 11.30. Thank you. Please do not discuss the case.
didn't realize the time was. All rise. It's honorable Superior Court now stands in recess. Please enter the courtroom.
Please be seated. Thank you. Um, we are waiting for well, I'm uh, Attorney assuming, McGinnis. I'm assuming that. This is like stuck. Oh, wait. Oh, I see what the problem no. is. Let me stick this one out. Make it easier. Oh, it keeps popping I, out, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the problem. It keeps popping out. But let's see if I hold the back of it for you. This is why we're using it. Get it? I think so. There. Right. Get it? <clears throat> <laughs> we can bring the jury back in. Does your honor want Mr. Put back on the stand? Yes. Okay, would counsel stipulate, please? Yes, sir. Right, thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Quint, you may be seated. Thank you. Um, let me actually go back a moment, sir, and go to this first Albany and Blue Hills camera, if I can. Your Honor, the state is also going to open, I believe, what was states 34. Uh, I. Sir, do you see the two items maybe a little squished together, but do you see them on the screen behind you? Yes. Okay. Now, with respect to the video, Albany and Blue Hills, if you can, could you please show the intersection if it appears? Yes. And the Blue Hill Street, sir? This is Blue Hill Street. This is Albany. Okay. And Milford. And this is Milford Street. Okay. And there's the McDonald's? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You could have a seat. Now, did the brief cam pick up that uh, tr car on another camera? Yes. Which camera, sir? Um, it picked it up at both Albany and Garden and the intersection of Albany and Garden. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can. What camera angle is that, sir? So this is the intersection of Albany and Garden, and this camera is faced uh, westbound and also kind of covers the south part of uh, Garden Street. If you wouldn't mind. Yes. Um, <laughs> sir, which street is Albany Avenue? This is Albany Avenue. And same questions as before. If you're driving upward away from the camera, is that towards Hartford or away? Uh, going uh, uh, westbound would be away from Hartford. That would be going forward from Hartford. So going towards Hartford would be bottom of the camera? Correct. Okay. Is this on the same <coughs> side as the last one, basically? Yes, it's on the south side. Okay. And this road that intersects with Albany over on the left? Uh, Garden Street. That's Garden Street. And this establishment, do you know what it is? Um, it's had a bunch of names over the past couple of years, so I don't know what it was called yet. Okay. 
And I'm actually gonna increase the time to seven thirty-eight. So for the record, seven thirty-eight oh eight. No, sir, I'm going to ask you the same question with respect to the map. This is Albany and Garden. Yes. Is that depicted on the map on States 34? It is. Um, Albany and Garden is the intersection. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm actually going to go. Which side of the street is the camera angle, sir? So the camera is on the southeast side. Okay. And Garden Street, if you could just point it out. Yep. Uh, Garden Street is here. Okay, thank you. Now, is this a movable or a fixed camera view? This is a fixed camera. Okay. And what camera angle is this, sir? So this is another fixed camera view, but this is faced east. And the um, road on the right? Uh, this, you're talking about this one? Yes, please. This would be Garden Street. This is Albany Avenue. Okay. And same questions. Uh, the Albany Avenue, if you keep driving straight, uh, does that go to um, the uh, Hartford or away from Hartford? It's still going further into Hartford. Okay. Now, is this a view that um, Brief Cam picked up? Yes. Okay. I'll go back a little. This camera view, sir. So this is another fixed camera at Albany and Garden, and it covers the eastbound direction and the northbound direction. This is Albany Ave. This is Garden Street. Okay. And this isn't one of those movable ones? Correct. Okay. And with respect to the garbage can, is that the same garbage can that we saw on the screen before? Now I have a quick question, sir. Do you see that black truck that's on that screen? Yes. Okay. If you can, just uh, following that up. Um, Is 
what's the difference between the two? Did Brief Cam pick up that other back black truck? It did as a black truck. <laughs> okay, but not as a Ford Raptor? So Brief Cam doesn't specify make and model vehicle, just specifies black or pickup. Uh, there's a few things that are unique about the Ford Raptor compared to the other truck. And what was that? Um, the tonneau cover in the back, the covering on the bed of the truck. Uh, the Ford Raptor has uh, hood scoops on the front, so uh, little indentations on the, the front of the hood. Okay, and so with, when you're going through this video, uh, were you looking at all the trucks uh, that were black and pickup trucks? Yes, that's where we started. Okay, and then you were able, you started, so did, were you able to narrow it further? Yes. Once, How were you able to do that? Once we started to see uh, the same trucks stopping, putting garbage bags and random garbage cans. Okay. So, what angle is this? So this this is a fixed camera at the intersection of Albany and Center, and this camera is faced uh, westbound. I'm going to stop here at 739.47. Do we see that same truck, sir? Yes. Okay. Is that the truck from that I pointed out before? I believe Is so, the yes. same? Okay. I'm going to stop it there. So I'm going to go back to picture one with the map. If you can, is the area of that intersection depicted on this screen? Yeah. Um, it's going to be uh, over here. I'm just... Yeah, it's about, it's about the camera's about to okay. in between uh, green and center. So Green Street is right here? Yes. Where is center? Uh, this is center street here. Okay. Like north south. And this uh, restaurant, Island Fish Head Restaurant, do you recall, do you know, if you do, if that was Island Fish Head Restaurant in 2019? I'm sorry? No. It wasn't or you don't know? I don't know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Stop at 741 12. Sir, what street is this? Green Street. Okay. And again, if you were driving, let me zoom back in. If you were driving Albany Avenue going to the left corner, upper left corner, which direction are you traveling now? So if you're traveling this direction, it would be traveling west. Okay. Is that towards Hartford or away? It would, it would be towards West Hartford. West Hartford? Yes. Okay, so if you're traveling towards the bottom right, would that be into the city of Hartford? Yes. Okay.
Sir, what intersection are we at again? This is Albany and Blue Hills. Is this the same camera that we started with? Yes. Okay. And oh. I apologize. Uh, back at the map, sir, if you could just point out where we are now. So we're back at the same intersection. This is uh, Milford Street, Albany Avenue, Blue Hills Avenue, and the camera is located in this southeast corner. Okay. Is the camera angled towards Hartford or away from Hartford? It's faced west. So away from Hartford? Away from Hartford. Thank you. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to Oh, seven forty seven twenty one. And again, sir, the street that's up here on the right where the cursor is, do you see that? That's Adams Street. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, if you can have a seat, Your Honor, the state's intention at this time is to ask about uh, the witness and inquire about some further video that was obtained. I believe there's an objection to it at this time. Well, that's fairly general. So the court does not know what the video evidence is or what I the just, objection is. Can, can we have a sidebar, please?
I may just have one moment, Your Honor. Yeah. The state's intention now to um, play states 37 and inquire for the witness, Your Honor. I... Uh, sir, if I may, uh, Mr. Quint, prior to playing anything, uh, was there a, were you asked to get or was further video from C4 regarding the intersection of Albany Avenue and Garden Street uh, obtained? Yes. Okay, and what uh, what time period? Uh, we were asked to save from the 24th to the 30th. Okay, was brief cam used at all during that um, time period? I don't recall. Okay, was that video given to anybody? Yes. Who was it given to? The state police. Okay, Your Honor, at this time the state would offer 512. Um, I can play it for the witness, but I don't know if council wishes to make an objection at this time. Uh, and, and, and if I may just inquire if, whether this is the uh, a proper witness for that, if I may. Your Honor, this uh, Mr. Quint works at C4. I plan on opening up the, the uh, video and inquiring the same questions as before, which is what camera this is and uh, My question like. is, did this witness then obtain the one, or did he use the word we, which usually suggests it wasn't, unless it's the royal we? It may not well, have been him, so well, I just want to clarify that. From the court's discussions, this witness can only testify as to the date, time, and location of the camera. That's what that the court is, understands. Yes, Your Honor, that is all I'm going to inquire from this witness, is which camera this is, the date, the time it shows, and then the state's intention is to offer the video and then rest be rest with Mr. Quinn. I, I just want to, it's from a different day. I just want to clarify, we're talking about a different day? We are, time? we are talking about a different day. Th then I would just say that it's um, not relevant to Ms. Traconis, but that's my objection. Thank you, overruled. Thank you. So I'm going to have you take a look behind you if you can. Now, sir, we only see three, uh, I guess, pictures on the screen. Uh, what location are these camera angles, please? Uh, so the first one on the top left, that's Albany Garden, Albany Garden, uh, you know, space southeast. Uh, the second one on the top right, Albany Garden, and the camera's east west. And then the last one is Albany Garden, and the camera's east west. And if you wouldn't mind, Albany and Garden West, what is the date and time of this video? Um, it's May 26th, 2019, at 6.48 a.m. Thank you. Sir, did you, you can have a seat okay. if you can. Thank you. And this camera angle? Uh, this is faced east. Of that same intersection? Yes. And the date and time? This is May 26, 2019 at 6.49.
We'll stop at 652.17. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Cross examination attorney showing order. No questions. Thank you. Well, you may step down. Thank you. Your Honor, the state has uh, Mr. Atmore, or I should say Trooper Atmore. I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Uh, Brett Atmore, B-R-E-T-T, A-T-T-M-O-R-E. And your affiliation? I'm with the Connecticut State Police. Thank you. And you may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. May I inquire, Your Honor? Yes. <coughs> good. Actually, it's good afternoon, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, what is your current assignment with the Connecticut State Police? I'm the resident trooper in Bar Campster. Okay, how long have you been the resident trooper at Bart Campstead? Uh, two and a half years. Prior to that, what did you do? Uh, on and off, I've been a patrol trooper. Um, and then uh, I, I spent about five years in major crime. When you say major crime, was there a particular division or department you were assigned to? I was assigned uh, out of the Troop H office and prior to that out of the uh, Westbrook Troop F office. Troop H, what it, does that cover? Uh, that's all of the, uh, there's 13 different towns, highways, uh, state buildings, prisons. Um, In what areas? Hartford, greater okay. Hartford area. So were you a part of the Central District Major Crimes? I was. Okay, for what years were you assigned to the Central District Major Crimes? Uh, 2016 to 2020. And with respect to, uh, well, what types of investigations does Central District Major Crime investigate? Uh, mostly uh, larger scale crimes, felonies, um, burg you know, uh, robberies, homicides, um, that sort of, the, the more major crimes. Okay. And who was your sergeant in 2019? Uh, it would be uh, Matt Gonzalez. Now, I want to draw your attention specifically to 2019, around the time of May 30th, okay? Yeah. Now, were you called to assist in the investigation to the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos? Yes. What was your assignment on that day? Uh, my supervisor uh, had me uh, go to C4, which is uh, part of Hartford uh, PD. Um, they have uh, surveillance, um, cameras access all around the city and I was uh, specifically tasked with uh, looking for a um, pickup truck, a black Ford F-150 uh, Raptor um, traveling in the city uh, on the 24th of May. Was there a specific time frame you were asked to look for? Uh, it was roughly uh, 7.30 p.m. Now, did you go to C4? I did. What day did you go to C4? Uh, May 30th. Now, did you review anything um, or watch any video cameras at C4? I did. By the way, as part of Central District Major Crimes, uh, did you work with C4? on multiple occasions? We did, yes. Okay, so you were aware of its capabilities? I was. 
So with respect to, I believe it's states 36. So briefly, I'm gonna have you take a look behind you. Do you recognize what's depicted there? I do. Okay, what is that? Uh, cameras um, along Albany Ave mm -hmm. in uh, Hartford. Okay. Um, now, when you arrived at C4 that day, did you uh, observe, if I can, This video footage, 739.05. Yes. Where were you when you watched this? I was at C4 in Hartford. Well, did you have any other officers with you? No, uh, other than maybe the random Hartford police officer in the building, not no one from uh, our agency. Okay. Now, after watching this video clip, um, did you take any action? I did. What did you do? Uh, I notified uh, my supervisor, Mac Gonzalez, about what I'd seen, uh, specifically the trash getting dropped off in multiple City of Hartford garbage cans um, in order to get uh, an evidence collection team to go and uh, access those or seize the contents. When you notified your sergeant, um, well, when did you do that? Right after I saw it. Uh, were you still physically at C4 I was, when you yeah. called him? Oh, why did you do that right away? Uh, just in the event that the trash got picked up, um, got uh, meddled with, I don't know. I wanted to have someone out there as soon as possible. And what day was this? What was the date? The 30th the of 30th May. Of May? Okay. Yeah. Um, with respect to the screen, uh, behind you, sir. If you can kind of draw your attention, if you could watch 739.26. I'm going to stop it at 739.38. Uh, with respect to this garbage can, did you notify the your sergeant with respect to that? I did. as well as this one? Yes. Okay. Now, did you look at other cameras as well? I did. Which ones? Uh, there was one uh, captured uh, Albany and uh, Milford Street, uh, one that was uh, Albany and Garden. Okay. Well, uh, another one at Albany and Green. Okay. And I think the last one was Albany and Adams. Do you see what's depicted here? I do. Okay, I'm gonna, this is Albany and uh, Blue Hills, I guess. If you can, sir, I'm gonna draw your attention to um, Now, sir, is this the a video recording that you watched on May 30th, 2019? Yeah. Sir, did you take any action with respect to 
uh, anything really after watching this video. Again, I notified my supervisor um, about the location of um, this particular instance. It looked like a, a sewer um, and well, something was placed in it. Let me ask you that actually, if I can go back just briefly. Did you notify your supervisor with respect to the garbage can? Uh, yes. Okay. And again, were you on C still at C4 when you made that call? I was. Now you also mentioned the sewer grate. Where is that located on the screen? Uh, kind of right up by the uh, passenger uh, door of the truck. If you wouldn't mind, sir, if you could go up and point. Uh, right here. And for the record, you're pointing to the middle right side. Thank you, sir. And you also mentioned, I believe, Albany and Green, was that correct? Yes. <clears throat> then I'm gonna go to Albany and Center camera. Seven forty one, please. Did you observe this while you were on C4 property? I did. And did you inform anybody uh, after what you saw on this? Yeah, again, I, I notified my supervisor. Did you actually go to Albany Avenue, sir? No. Now, do you recall what time of day this was that you watched these videos? Uh, I believe it was around um, 3 p.m. Okay. <clears throat> and after watching these videos and informing your sergeant, did you review other video from C4? I did. And what video did you resume, review? There was uh, more video of the corner of Albany and Garden. Um, and it, it was played up till uh, I think the 26th of and May. Why did you look for Albany and Garden video? Uh, that was a, a garbage can that uh, we saw trash placed in and we were just uh, interested to see if it had been picked up already um, by the uh, garbage service in the, in the city. Uh, just to be clear, the video you watched of the trash being placed in um, was the trash was placed in on what day? The 24th. Okay, and you watched it on uh, on which date? The 30th. Okay. Did you watch when you watched the video from the 24th? How far did you get, or how long did you watch the video for uh, to determine if the trash had been picked up from that garbage can? Uh, it was determined that that. that particular garbage can was picked up on the 28th. Okay. Do you, how do you know that? Uh, we could, we could see the garbage truck uh, picking up the garbage can, so. So did you watch the video for that time? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and it would, do you know what time the trash can came and picked up that video? Uh, I'd have to reference my report for the, the exact time uh, on the 28th. Um, do you have any idea or would you refresh your recollection take a look at your report? It would uh, refresh my recollection. Okay. If I could look at that. If I may have a moment, Your Honor. I 
Okay, look, uh, about 4.10 p.m. is when it got picked up. It was p.m. or a.m.? It was, or does it not say? Uh, it doesn't say. Okay. So, it so it does say hours. So it may be uh, 4.10 4 a.m. Okay, if I can have that back. Are you sure 4.10 a.m.? Yeah, yeah. Could, could I have that marked for ID, please? It is. Oh, thank you. And what's the number? Now, in your review of that video, sir, did you, that was Albany and Green? Or, I'm sorry, Albany and Garden? Uh, Albany and Garden. Yes. Uh, did, were you, uh, did you watch it to see, or were you aware of any video of anybody else rifling through that garbage can? Your Honor, I'm going to object to um, asking this witness to characterize what was being seen in the videos. The jury saw it. They can speak for themselves. Well, the question, well, the question is, did you observe anyone else rifling through the trash? I apologize, Your Honor. I will rephrase. Sir, did you see anybody else t go through that garbage can? Yes. Okay. At what time uh, or when, I should say? Uh, it was on the 26th of May. Uh, Sometime around 6 a.m., uh, if I could reference my report, I could give you a, a more accurate time. Yes. Thirty-nine for ID. Again, please uh, draw your attention to page two. You can go read it out loud. Take a look and take that request and recollect Okay, it does. Uh, uh, Six fifty-one a.m. I'm going to draw your attention to states 37. Please take a look. I'm going to play, please, Albany and Garden. Six fifty twenty five.
Sir, just uh, without asking you anything, um, without saying anything anybody said or anything like that, just yes or no, <coughs> sir, were you able to find the identity of who that person was? We were. Okay. Uh, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. I just would like to just look at the reports for a minute. Do you have one there in front of you? I, no, I don't. Sir, I just have like a couple of questions. So you had the snippets from this, the C4 video downloaded onto some kind of drive for you, correct? Correct. Was that on a flash drive, a DVD? What was it given to you on? Uh, I believe it was a flash drive. Did you pick what you wanted to have downloaded? Uh, they had already assembled a, a footage a lot of this vehicle's um, travels on Albany Ave, that's what I took. Oh, so they didn't make you sit there and watch like 24 or 48 hours of video yourself? Well, no, we were watching the truck, yeah. Right. And then um, when you say they, who's <laughs> they was watching? Oh, uh, the, the analysts at C4 that were assisting. All right, so we didn't look to see if anyone else came by or anyone else went through or dropped anything off besides that, correct? And I just want to be clear about the garbage truck you mentioned. You saw in one of the videos a garbage truck pick up trash along Albany Avenue and that at least some of those receptacles, right? One of them, yeah. And that was on May, you said, 28th? Correct. According to the time, right? According to the time. Did you, did you actually download that video as well? Yes. I think I have to say that. Thank you. Just one, sir. With respect to the garbage truck that you saw, um, it, did you see uh, that garbage truck stop at what location and pick up trash? Uh, that was Albany and Garb. Okay, but you didn't see it pick up trash at the other locations. <clears throat> I didn't. Thank you. Did you watch the multiple days from the 24th to 28th to see if any others got picked up? Uh, no. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Admore, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, with respect to our next witness, I believe he was told to come for one. We are ending the morning a little early. So you expect him for 2 o'clock? Yes, sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you are disappointed in that, we're sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll take our lunch and recess until 2 o'clock and resume with the state's witness at that time. Uh, please do not discuss the case and have a good lunch.
morning session. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you.
that Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, there's a witness. I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Michael Uden Jr. Last name B E A U T O N. I'm a sergeant with the Connecticut State Police. Thank you. Sergeant Buton, you may be seated. Thank you. Sergeant Buton, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Sergeant, how long have you been employed with the State Police? Uh, approximately 16 years. What were some of your initial assignments with the State Police? Uh, I started my uh, career with the State Police in November of 2007. I attended the training academy for approximately seven months. Um, you know, we were trained in uh, criminal investigation, accident investigation, firearms, emergency vehicle operations, et cetera. Uh, tested on uh, those uh, subjects. Uh, graduated in May of 2008. I was uh, assigned to Troop G in Bridgeport as a patrol trooper, uh, where I spent about uh, 10 years as a trooper there. Um, I had some ancillary duties during my time there. I was a patrol canine handler. Uh, who was cross-trained in narcotics detection. I was also a member of the State Police Tactical Unit. I was a tactical operator uh, and assistant team leader on the West Attack Team. 2018 is when I uh, was transferred to Western District Major Crime as a detective, uh, where I was stationed at the Troop G office in Bridgeport. Prior to becoming a State Police officer, did you serve in a branch of the United States military? I did. Which branch, sir? I was in the United States Marine Corps. And did you serve in any wars? I did. Which war? Uh, I was spent a little bit of time in Afghanistan, and I was deployed uh, with the infantry in a combat tour to Fallujah, Iraq. What years were you with the United States Marines? 2001 to 2006. Directing your attention now to May of 2019, what unit of the state police were you assigned to? In May of 2019, I was a detective assigned to the Western District Major Crime Squad. 
Have you since ascended to becoming a sergeant? Yes, I have. What year did that take place? I was promoted to sergeant April of 2022. Are you still with the Western District Major Crime? No, I'm not. Where are you currently assigned? Uh, presently uh, assigned as a detective sergeant with uh, Central District Major Crime Squad. I supervise the uh, Troop H CI office in Hartford. And just for the jury's benefit, when you say CI office, what does CI stand for? Criminal Investigation. I want to direct your attention now to May 28, 2019, a Tuesday. Did you become involved in the Jennifer Dulos investigation? Yes, I did. How did you learn about this case? Uh, from the phone call from my supervisor. Where did you report on May 28, 2019? Uh, that morning, I reported to the New Canaan Police Department. Why did you report to the New Canaan Police Department? Uh, so we were assisting the New Canaan Police with the missing persons investigation. And since they were the primary for the case, we worked out of their police department. Um, the crime scene was in New Canaan. The uh, person who was missing resided in New Canaan. So the uh, command staff at the time felt that that was the best place to work from. So that's why we were there. Approximately how many troopers and New Canaan police personnel were working out of the police department when you arrived on May 28th? Quite a few. Were you given any specific tasks on that day? Yes, I was. What types of tasks were you given? Uh, so <coughs> myself and uh, Detective Sergeant Duva went <coughs> over to 69 Wells Lane. Um, and we went into the three bay garage. I was assigned by Sergeant Petresca to take photographs of the shelving units that were in the I guess you'd call it the third garage bay. So if you're <coughs> facing the bays, there are three. It would be the far right bay. Um, so I took photographs of the shelves, and the purpose of those photographs were to then interview the nanny um, of the, the family of the, for the children uh, down in New York City. And we wanted to show her those pictures to see if she could um, identify any items that may be out of place or missing um, or that she didn't recognize. So that was the purpose of those photographs. If I were to show you those photographs, would you recognize them, sir? Yes, I would. For the record, Your Honor, we're projecting State's Exhibit 16, which is a disc. We can begin with item number three in that disc. Sergeant Buton, do you recognize this photograph? Yes, I do. What is that photograph of, sir? That is a photograph of uh, a couple of the shelving units in the right garage bay located at 69 Wells Lane, New Canaan. Is that one of the photographs that you took when you went to 69 Wells Lane? Yes, it is. And I'm just going to ask if we can call up item number four now. Could you just indicate to the jury what we're looking at here? Uh, so this photograph is also of the shelving units that were in the garage. Um, it's a little over from the other photograph, and it just depicts some sporting goods and uh, Tupperware containers and some other items. Thank you. Did you ultimately go to New York City? Yes. What day? Uh, the same day. Who, if anyone, went to New York City with you? Uh, Detective Ryan Frechette. What borough of New York City did you go to? Uh, so we were in Manhattan on Park Avenue for one of the stops. Um, I don't recall the other borough. Uh, Specifically with respect to Miss Almeida? It was in Manhattan. And did you meet with her? Uh, we did. Approximately for how long did you meet with Miss Almeida? Um, I don't remember uh, for how long. I'd have to look at my report to see. Um, I know there's a recording of our interview with her. Did you show her photographs of the garage that you had taken? Yes. 
And did she provide you with a statement? She did. After meeting with Ms. Almeida on May 28th, did you perform additional tasks for the case that week? Yes. Describe to the jury some of the things that you did. Uh, so we looked for uh, video footage. We canvassed some of the areas in New Canaan to try to find video. Um, and specifically Friday, May the 31st, um, I was tasked with going up to the Capital City Command Center um, to review some video footage with one of the intel analysts up there from uh, items uh, that had been recovered the night prior by the Central District Major Crime Squad. Uh, the purpose of me going up there was to ensure that um, nothing was missed. Who gave you that assignment? That was Detective Sergeant Ventresca. And when you say the purpose of your visit was to ensure that nothing had been missed, had someone already reviewed the C4 footage at that point? Yes, to my understanding, they had. Approximately what time of day did you arrive at C4? Uh, it was midday, late morning, early afternoon. And upon arrival at C4, which incidentally stands for Capital City Command Center, correct? That is correct. Who, if anyone, did you meet with? Uh, I can remember a meeting with uh, a gentleman by the name of Josh Quint, who was an intelligence analyst uh, with the Harvard Police Department. And when you met with Josh Quint, what did you do? Uh, so he began to take me through some of the footage that they had found um, using the computer program that they have. Um, they're able to find certain vehicles of uh, uh, a type and color, as I understand it. And so um, those folks were given the types of vehicles that we were interested in that were associated with Mr. Dulos. Uh, and so they, they ended up finding a black, what appeared to be a black Ford Raptor pickup truck traveling uh, along Albany Avenue, um, where Mr. Dulos had discarded um, several items in the city trash receptacles. So he began to so uh, show me some of that footage. <clears throat> and did you have a description of Mr. Dulos prior to arriving at C4? Uh, yes. And did you also have a description of someone named Michelle Traconis? Yes, I did. Do you see Michelle Traconis in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Could you point her out and tell us what article of clothing she's wearing, a shirt, a color shirt? She is seated uh, on the, my right side of the table over there. She's wearing what appears to be a blue coat and a green sweater. Judge, she identified the defendant. What was the general description of Michelle Traconis that you had? Uh, I, I didn't see any photo. Honor, hearsay? Well, what was the general description? Well, it's offered to show, as the court here, that what to look for. That's right. So overruled. What was the general description you had of Michelle Traconis? Uh, I didn't have a photograph of her, but I was told that she was uh, uh, middle-aged, tall, slender, and had brown hair. And have you since had a chance to meet with uh, the defendant in person? Yes. And did she match that general description? She did. As you were reviewing the C4 footage, did you review <clears throat> any video in which it appeared that an object consistent with a weather tech liner was displayed? Yes, I did. Your Honor, I'm going to object. The video speaks for itself. The wit the the, the jury has now seen it multiple times. That's a leading question. It also assumes facts not in evidence, and I ask that it be stricken. Well, well the question was, did you uh, review the video and see what would be described as a weather tech map? Well, that's leading. The jury has seen the video, but the court is not certain that the jury could conclude that what came out of that vehicle was a weather tech mat. So as far as a leading question is concerned, the court will sustain the objection. Did you review video in which uh, um, someone, well, strike that. Did you, did you also have a description of Mr. Dulos? Yes, I did. And what was that general description? Uh, also the same, middle-aged uh, white male. Um, 
average height and build. And did you review video in which Mr. Dulos had objects in his hands? Your, Your Honor, I'm going to object. Nobody has identified the video individual at this point. So it's not only leading, but it's assuming facts not in it. I'll rephrase. <clears throat> did you review video in which someone who matched the general description of Mr. Dulos that you had been provided had objects in his hands? Yes, I did. All right. And can you describe for the jury in general terms, what type of objects you viewed in this individual's hands? Again, Your Honor, the jury has seen the video. It's not proper for this witness to editorialize about what's in the video. He can certainly testify to what he did, but to let him describe it is, I suggest, uh, some of the jury on their own can figure that out. Well, the court disagrees that the jury on its own can figure that out. It is not clear that the jury could figure out that what was held was a weather tech mat. The jury can figure out what a garbage bag looks like, but the court is going to overrule the objection. You may answer, sir. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question for me? <clears throat> Did someone who matched the general description of Mr. Dulos have any objects in his hand, and can you describe what objects you viewed? Uh, yes, so several. Um, I observed the individual take what appeared to be uh, contractor-style black garbage bags from uh, the rear of his vehicle. Um, a uh, What I would describe to be um, a square or rectangular um, black rubber mat cons consistent with being like a floor liner or something like that. Um, let's, well, let's just stop there for just one second. If we can call up, I'm just going to ask if I can. <coughs> this is States 36. going to ask that we pause it right there for just one moment. Um, Sergeant Buten, is this the uh, C4 footage that you reviewed? Yes, it is. We're just going to pause that for one second. Is this the um, mail that you were referencing earlier that matched the general description of Mr. Dulos? Yes, it is. Just going to pause it there. Sergeant Buten, you testified earlier that you observed this male holding what appeared to be a rubber mat. Is that correct? Correct. Is this the object that you were referring to? Yes, it is. And again, Your Honor, I just want to make clear I'm objecting. This is lay opinion, it's speculation. Um, there's no, from this, you could certainly not tell what material it's made out of, it's irrelevant. And I, I also just would throw in that it's a characterization of a video. This is not firsthand. So, uh, and finally, this is, um, I would say, a violation of the Code of Evidence 4-3. Well, the court, based on the video and the objection, would pose a question. Sergeant Buten, did you find out later that that was a square or rectangular rubber mat or did you determine that just from this video 
that that was a square rectangular rubber mat. So it appears to me just based on the video, Your Honor, but I also had knowledge of the fact that there was one missing. Well, again, it's now. Well, the answer is, the answer is, it appears that way, but I took other things into consideration. That's the answer, which suggests to this court that the video alone does not suggest that this is a black square rubber mat. The video alone, according to this witness, he did not conclude on the video alone that that was a WeatherTech mat. So you may proceed. Yeah, and just to be clear, you're not 100% sure what that is, correct? Absolutely not. You're testifying it's consistent with what appears to be. Well, that's a mischaracterization. It appeared to him to be a black rectangular mat. He had other information that led him to believe it was a WeatherTech mat. That's the testimony. It appeared to be consistent with a rubber mat. That court is indicating it's sustaining the objection. You can finish playing it. Are you familiar with something known as WeatherTech Liner? Uh, yes, I am. What is WeatherTech Liner? Uh, they're laser cut floor liners. I actually own a pair myself. Um, the company is here in the United States, and they basically make custom floor liners for a multitude of different vehicles, makes models and years and whatnot. They make uh, front and rear floor liners, utility area liners, seat covers, etc. Yeah, the commercials are all over TV. And what material are WeatherTech liners made out of? A uh, black rubber material. Or a hardened plastic, I guess, would probably be a better description. But the, the mats in the back are more uh, more rubber. I think the, the floor liners where your feet go are harder, but the ones for the back are a little more flexible, I guess, is, is how I describe them. And when you, when you say in the back, what area of the vehicle are you referring to? The car. Your Honor, I'm going to object foundation. The fact that he might own an SUV or might know something about it, it's irrelevant. And he's not an expert in this area. He doesn't work for uh, the WeatherTech or any other company that installs mats. So therefore, I would argue that this is not appropriate question. Well, the question has to do with what does WeatherTech manufacture? That's how the court understands the question. And if he's familiar with, if this witness is familiar with what WeatherTech manufactures, the court will allow the test. So, overruled. When, when you mentioned the back, what area of the vehicle are you referring to? Uh, the cargo area, the utility area, uh, the back of an SUV behind the seats. <clears throat> Did there come a point in time where you reviewed um, additional uh, surveillance footage in which the person who appeared to be the same male operator discarded additional items? Yes. Can you describe that for the jury? Uh, yes. So the final stop that the individual appearing to be Mr. Dulos made was on Albany Avenue in front of a Jamaican bakery, I believe at the intersection of Blue Hills Avenue. Um, he exited his vehicle with what appeared to be maybe a pile of papers or something. Again, Your fact. Honor. I'm, I don't know what it was. I'm objecting. What appears, again, is the same thing. If well, it's not recovered. Well, he just indicated he did not know what it was. So perhaps you did not hear that part of his response. He said it appears to be paper. I don't know what it was. Is what he, said. he exited his vehicle with, I don't know what it was. That's the testimony. Uh, so, so, it's, 
So he exited the vehicle with it with unknown objects, something in his hands. I just couldn't make out what. And he walked over to the trash receptacle and he discarded whatever that uh, unknown object or group of objects were. However, um, another object remained in his hand um, that he did not discard in the garbage. And at C4, they have very large screen TVs, much like this one, and they can zoom in. And when we zoomed in, um, Mr. Quinton and myself were of the opinion that it looked Objection. like- Objection. Well sustained. When you zoomed in, were you able to see the colors of the object discarded in the store more clearly? Yes. Can you describe to the jury what color the object was? So the object overall looked white, and we saw like um, orange and blue um, on the object. And I could, I could say what that to me that looked like. But I... No, that's all right. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> now, um, actually, we're just, if we could play that portion of the video. We could pause it right there. Sergeant Buton, I just want to direct your attention now to the vehicle itself. Does it appear as though a female passenger has exited the vehicle at this point? I'm going to object. First of all, it's a mischaracterization. Nobody's exited it. And second of all, we're again having him characterize what's on the video that all of these jurors can see. I would submit that under State versus Holly, it's improper for a lay witness to narrate a video when he wasn't <clears throat> present for the incident. So if I can just be heard on this, Your Honor, and, and if I have to be heard at sidebar, I will, um, but I, I'd like to make an offer of proof to the court. Well, the question is, does it appear to you as if a female is exiting the Raptor? That's the question. So does it appear to you that a female passenger is exiting the Raptor? Well, the question itself you can be heard, counsel. The question itself is an interpretive narrative. What the court and the jury is able to see is a door open, someone leaning out of that door. The issue of whether it's a female and whether she's exiting in the common sense of exiting, as in getting out of the vehicle, according to this video, would be a mischaracterization. I'll rephrase, Judge. So Can you just, it. at this point, the video is paused. Can you, um, directing your attention now to the individual uh, just above the male operator, can you describe that individual for the jury? Again, Your Honor, I think the, the image <laughs> speaks for itself. And this witness is not in any better position than the jurors to see what's in the video. Well, in fact, Maybe you could sharpen better. the question, counsel. Can, can you describe the individual? What is seen here? You cannot tell height or weight. So you, what can be described from what is on the video is fairly limited. If that's the video from which you are asking the question. It is, Your Honor. I'm just simply asking him to describe what he's observing on the video. Well, 
what the court is going to do is listen to the description and entertain any objections after that. Could you describe the individual um, above the male operator? Uh, yes. So uh, it appears to be a white female. Uh, looks like wearing a short sleeve shirt and kind of hard to tell, but maybe her hair is in a ponytail. And I can see at least one of her feet on the sidewalk and her right hand appears to be reaching down toward, um, toward the, the brick or the pavement. Did, was this the only time um, that you observed a female with this particular male individual in the, in the surveillance footage? On this footage, yes. Keep playing. Sergeant Buton, where on Albany Avenue is this particular trash receptacle and store located? I believe the address is 1344 Albany Avenue. It's at the intersection of Blue Hills. Based on what you saw on this video, can you describe for the jury what actions you took? Uh, yes. So, uh, as I stated earlier, um, the individual appearing to be Mr. Dulos through some items. I'm going to object. The question else. was, what did you do next? And instead, he's giving another narrative. Well, the question is, well, what did you do after reviewing the video? And he began by saying, the individual who appeared to be Mr. Dulos, this is preliminary, as the court hears it, overruled. Um, the fact that uh, I observed that individual throw those things out in the trash receptacle but choose to discard whatever the other object was down the storm drain um, was interesting to me. And I wanted to try to recover whatever that was. Um, and so I inquired with the C4 folks um, about who maintained the storm drain and who we would use to um, assist us in recovering that item. And the answer I was given was <coughs> Uh, which is the Metropolitan District Control, or the a water authority, essentially, for the greater Hartford area. Um, they sent out a pump truck to us out on the street. Um, well, let, me ask, let me ask you another question. Sure. Did you head to this area of Albany Avenue? Yes. Approximately how long did it take you to arrive? I don't remember. Was it within the hour, would you say? Uh, yes. And who, if anyone from the state police, met you at this location? Uh, Detective Fitzsimons, uh, Detective Zella, who was on the dive team, um, Trooper Sanders, Trooper Chapman, also divers. Um, I had divers come just because I didn't know what we were going to encounter, if we were going to need them to go down there, or if the pump truck was going to be able to facilitate removing the item. Um, a lot of unknowns, so I was just trying to think outside the box and bring whatever resources I knew we had available to the area. And you indicated that MDC um, showed up with a pump truck. Is that correct? That's correct. And once, once MDC arrived with the pump truck, what happened next? Uh, Detective Zella and myself um, basically told them to empty out the truck. They had relayed to us that they were pumping out other drains that day, uh, and we wanted to ensure that the truck, the tank itself was empty, so that if uh, whatever was down there maybe was sucked up the hose, we'd be able to empty out the back and definitively say that whatever was in the tank came from that particular storm drain. Did the MDC truck leave at that point? Yes. Did it eventually return? It did. Approximately how long did it take to return? Maybe a half an hour or so. And during this half hour, did you remain at that location with your fellow state police officers? Uh, I left quickly to meet up with the search and rescue canines. I gave them a map 
so they could begin to search the area of Albany and Milford. Um, the footage depicted that black raptor turning onto Milford Street and uh, disappearing for some time before it came back out into the view on Albany Ave. So <clears throat> I got the search and rescue canines into that area so that they could begin to search that area. And after I met with them, I came back to um, the area of the storm drain. And were you present when the MDC truck arrived? Yes. Do you recall how many employees from MDC responded? Two, I believe. <clears throat> when they arrived, what steps did they take in your presence? Um, they had showed us the back. They opened it up, showed us it was empty, closed it. Um, they removed the grate um, from the storm drain. They had like a big hook that they put down there and pulled it out. Um, they lowered a hose down into uh, the storm drain where all the water was, and they turned on their truck and started to suck out water. As they were sucking out water, can you describe what happened next? Uh, yes, the, uh, the envelope <clears throat> actually got stuck to their equipment um, and they were able to pull it out like that. All right, I wanna just break this down a little bit. You say the envelope, can you describe what you heard as they were sucking uh, water out of the sewer? Yeah, it was like a clink, it was like a clink noise. And after you heard the clink noise, what did you see next? Uh, as they began to lift their equipment up, you could see that there was um, an envelope, like a FedEx envelope that was coming up out of the water with their equipment. And Detective Fitzsimons had gloved hands and he reached in and recovered um, the envelope and put it over by the sidewalk, opened it up. And when he opened it up to pull out the contents, we saw two Connecticut license plates in the envelope. <coughs> Were photographs taken of those license plates? Yes. May I have this marked for identification, Your Honor? What number? Well, not yet, but yes. <clears throat> 40 for identification. I did provide Attorney Schoenholm with a copy. I don't know if there's any objection. No objection. Thank you. Move it in as a full exhibit. 40 admitted as a full exhibit. I'm just going to begin with um, <coughs> displaying a photograph labeled 683 underscore 0001. Sergeant Buten, do you recognize that photograph, sir? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what that photograph is? Uh, that photograph is a picture of the white envelope that was uh, recovered from the storm drain on Albany and Blue Hills. On and Friday, you, May 31st. Did you witness this envelope in the position it is in this photograph? Yes. Showing you um, photograph labeled 683 underscore 0002. Are those the license plates? Yes, they are. And did you view these license plates um, in their uh, position? Yes. As they are in this photograph? Yes. And these are, this is photograph 03 in that file. This, these are the same license plates, is that correct? Yes, sir. Photograph number four. Same license plates, correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, actually, if we could just leave that up for one second. The um, license plate here reads 5T6. WBU, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. 
while you were um, present, were any efforts made <clears throat> by state police personnel to run these license plates? Yes. What were the results when these license plates were run? Uh, I called into dispatch and ran them as they are, and they came back to nothing. When you say they came back to nothing, what does that mean? It means there was no record found, meaning no such plates existed in the Connecticut DMV database. And so after you received notification that no such plates existed, did you notice anything about the sequence of the letters and numbers themselves? Uh, well, yeah, we noticed that they were a bit odd. Um, typically, uh, plates that were issued out like that were, um, would start with three numbers and then end with three letters. And obviously here you have um, a letter mixed in with the numbers. Uh, so that was odd to us. And uh, to Detective Fitz uh, Simons' credit, he actually, uh, with his gloved hand, started to mess around with some of the characters that looked funny, funny to us. And that's when we realized there was some effort made to alter their appearance. And when you say that there was some effort made to alter their appearance, can you be a little bit more descriptive for the jury? Yeah, yes. Um, so if, if I may, can I? Yes, sir. So this, this T here, when uh, Detective Fitzsimons messed around with it, we could see that the, the top portion actually wasn't the plate itself. It was some type of blue tape with like a clear adhesive is the best way I could describe it. So this character is actually a one. Um, the same here, this was made to be a B, but it's actually a D. And then here we have what is supposed to be a J with the extra material added to make it appear to be a U. So were you able to discern what the actual plate numbers and letters were? Yes. And was a subsequent um, search done for those particular plates? Yes, it was. Who did that? I did. And what were the results, sir? So I called dispatch back and ran the plates the correct way. And they came back uh, canceled on a 2007 Chevy Suburban uh, that was registered to Mr. Duos. This mark for identification. Yeah. I think it's a full exhibit by agreement. Yes. I just want to make sure what's in the album is what I think is in the album before we do that. That's my only thing. I don't want to be surprised, so if I can just see what's in there. I'm sure, would you like this? I could read this Oh, yeah. Why don't we just leave it for ID for a moment? I probably won't have any objection. I just want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Thank you. Detective Buton. Better pair. <laughs> Detective Buton, did you um, seize those license plates? Yes. And um, how were those license plates seized? I put them into a bag and secured them in the trunk of my cruiser. And if I were to show you... <coughs> Would you recognize them? Yes, I would. We have some gloves in front of you, sir. Oh, very good. So at this point, I'm just going to ask, well, firstly, let me ask a preliminary question. Um, there is evidence tape on this particular exhibit. Is that correct? Yes. And there's also what appears to be uh, numbers DSS 19 Zero zero two nine eight four. That's the state laboratory number. Is that correct? That's correct. So these license plates have been sent to the state lab since you seized them. Is that fair to say? That would be accurate. Yes. Um, I'm just going to ask that you cut open this envelope and just peer inside and tell us what you see. Okay.
two of the two Kennedy license plates that. Is there anything else in the back, sir? Um, I have to open it up a little more to see, sorry. Yes, there is. What else is in the back? It's, uh, it's a white FedEx uh, envelope that the plates were in. Are these the objects that you seized on May 31st, 2019? Yes, they are. Judge, I move it in. Um, I need to see what else is in the back. I just don't want to bring it through. Okay. There are. There are. We just maybe do it over here on the side. Have no objection to looking out of these other items that were in there will have to be to a different witness. So as long as it's those are kept separate, I'm fine with that. And that is that stage 40? This is stage 40, Judge. And just for the record, there are several smaller envelopes which we're going to tie up through another witness. Attorney Schoenhorn is asking that we do so. I have no objection to that. However, I do want to keep everything together at this point. So if these can be labeled, perhaps. Um, you know, 40A, excuse me, 41A um, for identification purposes only, and if we can just keep everything together for the time being. So, stage 40 will be admitted as a full exhibit. 40, 41, Judge. 41 will be admitted as a full exhibit. 41A is for ID purposes only. Correct. Actually, there's several of them. Um, so, we'll just label them A through. How, well, um, how many are there? Forty one A through G identification purposes only. Well, it's about three thirty-three. So we are going to stand in our afternoon recess, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please do not discuss the case. We shall return at three forty-three. I'm sorry, three forty-eight. Three forty-eight. All uh, rise. This honorable spirit court now stands in recess until 348. We didn't ask the court.
Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you. All right, they're coming in. We can bring Sergeant Buton back in. Yes, sir. And we can bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Thank you. Can you? It's been entered into evidence. States. I'm just going to ask that you take out the license plates and the FedEx envelope. Okay. Yes, it, yes, it has. Um, and that was obviously done subsequent to your seizure, is that correct? Yes. All right. And uh, can you just display the next plate also? And similar situation, the adhesive that you had discussed earlier has been removed, is that correct? Yes. And I'm just going to ask if you could just fan out the FedEx envelope for the jury as well. So before we proceed, we would ask the photographer during the course of the testimony to return to the designated area. to the clerk. Sergeant Buten, are those the items that you 
seized from the sewer drain on Albany Avenue on May 31st, 2019? Yes, they are. And did you subsequently turn over those items to Detective Matthew Riley of the State Police? Yes. If I just have a moment, Judge? Yes. Nothing additional at this time, Your Honor. Your cross examination. Thank you. These license plates exhibit 41, you indicated that it came back to a vehicle that had been owned by Fotis Dulos, correct? Yes, sir. And as I understand it, that was a 2007 Chevy Suburban, is that correct? That is correct. That Chevy Suburban uh, and these license plates, let me, let me withdraw that and ask it a different way. The license plates had been canceled for many years, correct? I believe so, yes, sir. The Chevy Suburban had not been registered to Mr. Dulos or his company for many years, correct? That's accurate, yes. At least, um, you said, at least since 2015, if not earlier, right? I don't recall the exact day, but that sounds about right. The reason I'm asking to clarify, there's been some testimony that he owned a, a Chevy Suburban in 2019, correct? I believe it was a newer model, yes, sir. That, that's what I was going to get to. So that model had its own registration, right? Correct. And different license plates, right? Yes. This was a vehicle that he had owned maybe prior to 2015, if not several years earlier, right? At, at least as early as 2007, yes, sir. Well, when it was... The when, it's a 2007 vehicle. So right, but I'm saying it, it ceased to be registered to him at least before 2015, correct? I can't give you the exact year uh, when they were canceled without looking at the teletypes, um, but that sounds fair enough. Right. Well, there may be some evidence of that further down. I was just trying to remember if you re recollected that when you did the, you said you had somebody run those plates, right? Yes, I did. And that would be through the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? Uh, well, yes, sir. So a dispatcher would use the collect system, which accesses the DMV database, yes. Yeah, and for the record, collect is, that's what it's called, C-O-L-L-E-C-T, they can look up old motor vehicle registrations, right? Among other things, yes, sir. And license plates. Yes. And see who was the last person to have that those plates registered to them, correct? Accurate, yes, sir. Okay, very good. When you um, testified that you saw a, a female, or the, you described the, the video that was at that location near, uh, I think it was Green Street, correct? Uh, Maybe in between Blue Hills. Blue Hills, yes, sir. Blue Hills, okay. So when you described that, you said that it, um, I think the words you used, that it met the general description of what you understood to be Michelle Traconis, right? Yes. And you gave a general description of her to, to the jury, right? Yes. And you're aware that, that Michelle Traconis told your colleagues that was, in fact, her in the uh, Ford Raptor, correct? I am now, yes. And she also, you're also aware that she told your fellow uh, state police officers that the driver, in fact, was Fotis Dulos on that day, right? As I sit here today, yes. Right. So when we're talking about it, it looks like maybe at least my client told the police, yes, that's me and that's Fotis Dulos in that vehicle, right? Yes, sir. And although we've watched a number of different angles, you sat at C4 headquarters in Hartford and watch the various cameras, right? Yes, sir. But so that we're so that we're clear, despite the fact that there are multiple camera angles, in fact, the number of times that Fotis Dulos got out of his truck to throw something away totaled three that you can observe, correct? I'd have to look at my report, sir, to see. There's a the intelligence analyst produced like a timeline of all the occurrences but I can't recall how many of that is right does now. That, does that seem right to you? I don't want to commit to a number without looking at the report. I'm not really sure how many exactly. But if, even if we're looking at six, seven, or eight different angles, there aren't seven or eight different stops that we're looking at. In, in other words, each of those cameras isn't a different stop, is it? Each of the angles that view? Each of the cameras that we've watched is not a different 
stop with something being thrown away. Do you understand the question? I'm not sure I understand what you're getting at. Sorry. I'll ask it a different way. The number of times that Mr. Dulos got out and threw something in away from his truck is not equal to the number of cameras that we have here in this courtroom observed. Is that a fair statement? That would be accurate, yes. Okay. We've, in other words, we've seen more cameras than, than actual throwaway stops, right? Well, we've seen only a few here today. I don't know what else you've seen prior to me coming on the stand, but well, I'm saying what we've, we've seen under my testimony, okay. yes. Fair enough. Now, as far of as the, the what we've watched since you've been here, the garbage bags <laughs> that you observed being thrown away were all black garbage bags, correct? I believe so, yes. You also described a rolled up item, and we had some debate about what it is, but you saw it was a rolled up black thing, right? Uh, yes, sir. And whatever that was, it had some kind of a white mark or white um, area that one could see as it's being carried over to a garbage pail that's not on the street but next to a building, right? Yes. Were you able to determine what that label or white mark was? I can, I can only speculate. I have no idea. Right. Well, I'm saying, other than that, you weren't able to use any of your you know, state police camera equipment or anything to be able to zoom in or the C4 to zoom in on what that is? No, sir. My understanding that uh, I think uh, an individual took that mat away um, prior to it being recovered. So I don't think it was ever recovered. Okay. Well, let's, let's back up. I'm talking about from the cameras at the time it's being carried over to the side of a building by Mr. Dulos. Were you able to zoom in or use anything to figure out what that mark that white spot was no sir now you just it said something that that i wanted to follow up on it I'm, I'm curious about that you said that someone took it away is that right that's my understanding yes did you see in any of the c4 cameras that you were watching anyone pick up that item and cart it away no, sir. That was information that was relayed to me by other individuals. Well, I'm asking about you. you. Me personally, no. I didn't see that. And th through all the time you spent, how many hours did you spend at the Capitol Command Center there looking at? Uh, I don't remember specifically. Um, it wasn't terribly long. Um, they had reviewed the footage in detail. Um, and what they went over with me were the stops that he made. Um, and uh, we kind of honed in on the last one because uh, we knew the storm drain had not been checked. And so that was kind of my focus, if you will, uh, was that particular stop. Okay, fair enough. And just so we're also clear, from the video you saw, you could not tell whether that, that rolled-up item was carpeting or plastic or rubber, any particular material. Is that right? It could have been anything. It could have been anything. There's no way to actually ever know unless I actually went there and put my hands on it. And although Mr. McGinnis kept talking about weather tech, it could have been any brand of any kind of plastic or rubber mat, right? Yeah, that's accurate. Did anyone ever recover <coughs> that map? Not to my knowledge, no. The C4 camera continued to look in that same location, right? At the, it was fixed at that same spot where the camera observed the raptor pull up and it then something get taken out of the back and put there, right? The camera to capture that, yes. And did the camera continue to run for the next several days? Uh, I was, my understanding is, is those cameras run 24-7. The time that, and when did you, just so I'm clear about the date, when did you go to the location on Albany Avenue where, with the MDC uh, sewer pump truck? The date? The date. Friday, May the 31st. Okay, that was the day. And did you have, did you go yourself and look through any of the, C4 cameras even uh, fast forward to see where and when that item, rolled up item, uh, went. 
No, sir, I was not assigned to do that. I take it when you were there uh, at that location, you didn't see it there, right? No, sir, I did not. Let me just have a moment. <clears throat> I have no, no further questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Nothing further, Judge. Thank you, Sergeant Buton. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. And Judge, we will be recalling the sergeant here in the trial. Thank you. And uh, are there any other state witnesses to be called today? Not today, Your Honor. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have concluded the testimony for today. And for tomorrow, Attorney McGinnis, Attorney Manning, uh, do we have our witnesses lined up? Your Honor, for tomorrow, uh, yes, I have at least a most of the witnesses lined up. There are a few additions that we are trying to schedule. I will let council know through email today once we get those concrete. Um, but it, beyond that, we do have witnesses to be presented. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are excused for today. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we will resume tomorrow at 10 o'clock and please do not discuss, discuss the case or avoid any media about the case. Thank you. Adjourned. All right.